late 2017. Um, and my interactions with students have been different. Um, and I guess we can get into that more so later with questions. But I've also been a mentee. I feel like mentoring for me has been very influential in my career success. Um, I've been a part of several professional development organizations such as MSPHDs, um, my internship with SOARS and Hollins, as well as um, I'm a current Bill Anderson Fund Fellow alumni, which increases the underrepresentation of minorities in the hazards and disasters field. Um, I also felt it was very important for me to have mentors not only within my field, but also outside of my field, people who look like me, people who are women, people that don't look like me um, and just to get a, a well-rounded perspective um, for my life um, which is crazy sometimes obviously um, so um, yeah I'm here to answer I guess questions on working with um, high school students undergraduates but also um, being someone who is actively being mentored by several individuals And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, uh, Marty. Would you like to uh, say your introductory remarks? Uh, sure. So I'm Marty Snow. I'm a research scientist at the University of Colorado, the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. I uh, do solar research, and I also run an, a 10-week uh, REU program in solar and space physics uh, at what we call the Boulder Solar Alliance. It's a uh, uh, LASP uh, at CU and then also uh, several other institutes around Boulder. So we get uh, uh, a wide range of, of mentors in the program. So uh, I, of course, uh, have greatly benefited from uh, being mentored uh, in, in my career, uh, you know, as a, an undergrad and a grad student, and then also as a junior scientist, uh, um, you know, other scientists uh, continue to mentor me uh, to this very day. Uh, and um, I don't know, I guess that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Um, Davin, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at CU Boulder. And my mentoring experience is, is largely with mentoring graduate students and, and postdocs these days. Uh, but also we, we do have uh, undergraduate researchers in our lab and, and I mentor um, as a academic advisor, undergraduate students in mechanical engineering and environmental engineering. Um, and then I have participated in some campus or, or programs uh, run through campus and also NGAR, uh, bringing in uh, undergraduate or, or graduate level researchers from uh, from the university or from even from out of town, programs like, like SOARS, uh, Rebecca funds, and um, yeah, so I, I'll talk about some experience. I think mentoring a, across a, a range of, of experiences and then also some of my own experiences coming up in academia and uh, you know receiving mentorship at the level of an undergraduate to how I continue to receive mentorship from, from colleagues and, and peers to this day. Thank you, Devin. And then um, our last clip, we'll have Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, do you want me to share your slide now or wait a minute? No, we can do that later, maybe when we get to mentoring models or something. Uh, I'll just go ahead and do a quick introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Haka. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I serve currently as the Director for Education and Outreach here at NCAR. And um, I also lead the ASP program that is in part coordinating um, this mentoring panel today. And um, before I stepped into my current role, I was the PI and the director of the source program that Derek had mentioned earlier. So I've always had the pleasure throughout my career here in the US to support many mentors who are very dedicated and awesome. And I've learned a lot just seeing uh, what it takes to mentor. I've mentored myself, um, I feel quite a bit and truly enjoy it. And I think I've also been very lucky uh, to have had great mentors. And I, um, I wanna say that I think mentors come from so many different directions at us and sometimes we have to be able to recognize them 
They might not always be in our STEM world. Um, they might not always be somebody who um, is ahead of us career-wise. I think some of the best mentoring I get from peer mentors or from people who might um, time-wise be um, early career, but have taught me a lot. So I think I've learned that mentoring comes in, um, in many facets. And even today on the chat, I'm recognizing people I would consider my mentors. So that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Curtis, for, for leading us. Certainly, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, so for those of you who may be joined late, um, what we're going to do now is we'll transition into just a general question and answer session. Um, we ask that if you have questions, you type them in the chat, and then I'll refer those questions to the speaker. Um, I'll do my best certainly to get to all questions as they come. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and lead off with the first question. Um, and specifically, Rebecca, I know you did mention those mentoring models. And so I think um, I think it would be worthwhile if to share your slide um, with the group and to talk maybe about mentoring models and then any of the other panelists mm -hmm. welcome you to join as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think when um, when I think about mentoring and what I just tried to hint at a little bit is that um, we have to see in our entire environment who we work with and even who we interact with day to day, who could be um, who can serve as mentors for different purposes. And once we pull up one model, the source program is known for having multiple mentors per student. And uh, so if you're familiar with the source model, there you have a science mentor, a writing mentor, a community mentor, a peer mentor, a computing mentor. And that sounds like a lot, and it's often not quite as easy to manage in one single summer, having to interact with so many people and take guidance from all of them. But I think it's, it's very worthwhile because you learn a little piece from, from each person. And so while in a program like SOARS, it's kind of a formalized approach, I wanna show you um, if Curtis can help us pull that up, um, a model that the Earth um, Science Women's Network shares, which I think is very valuable. So if you can see the screen, um, we consider this the support network map. So it doesn't specifically speak to mentoring, but I think it fits very well. So in the center of this is you, and you can think about many different things that you might need in your life and in your professional career. And as you see here in the different bubbles you have on top, something is who really gives you valuable feedback, honest feedback. Um, who, is in ch who supports you in your professional development? Who is there for you in emotional support? Or who is your intellectual community? But also who can provide a safe space for you just to vent, to check in, those kind of things. Who's a role model for you, etc. And if you're honest, no single person can be all of these things for you. If you have that in someone, that's incredible and you're very, very lucky. You might also want to think not to overtax that single person. But what you can do as an exercise, and we will share uh, three hands out, handouts with you by the end of the call, um, is to try to fill this in. Who do you have in your life, in your professional life, in your personal life um, that can fulfill these roles? And if you have empty circles by the end of the exercise, that tells you where you might need to look a little bit more and where you can create um, maybe a bigger network. Or as I said earlier, if you have the same name in all of the bubbles, that might not be the best professional safety net. So I, I like this way of thinking about mentoring in terms of not every single person can be everything to you. And honoring and acknowledging that some people might fit in one of these categories really, really well, and forgive them if they're maybe not helping you with some of these other areas. So that's, Kurt, is one way I think about mentoring and mentoring models. And I'm not sure if the other panelists want to speak to that multi-mentoring model as well. 
I agree, Rebecca. Um, as I mentioned before, I didn't know that there, that was actually a model. Um, honestly, when I read Curtis's questions about mentoring models, I was like, oh, yeah, I have no theory about that. But I actually do have mentors and a lot that meets a lot of those different things. And I did that on purpose and also encouraged my students to have mentors in different um, stages um, similar to that. So I really do like that uh, concrete example. Certainly, thank you. Um, and so we do have one question in the chat. This comes to us from uh, Daphne Ledoux. And she notes that given the ongoing health situation in the world, many programs, specifically REU programs, are looking to go online this summer. And so what are some key elements of mentoring that may take some extra thought or effort transitioning from an in-person format to an online? And that's to no one in particular. Uh, so uh, uh, I certainly uh, have been thinking a lot about this for, for my RU program. I think uh, it's almost certainly got to be uh, online this year. <clears throat> and uh, and the, uh, you know, one of the challenges in an in-person uh, RU is sometimes that uh, the students and the mentors don't, don't communicate uh, well enough that, you know, the, the mentor will be waiting for the student to, uh, to come talk to them. Uh, and uh, and the student will be uh, you know hesitant to go interrupt the the mentor you know in their busy schedule so so I think one of the the things that I will need to stress to the mentors is uh, you know we set up regular uh, times that you're going to communicate and make sure that that you know you don't you don't just let that slide I think this is going to be even more important in the in the, the remote. Uh, position is, you know, communication is always key and maybe in this situation it's keyer. I think it's also important for the students to have a way to connect, whether that's via GroupMe or um, weekly Zoom meetings or something like that, because they will be missing out on the, I guess, day-to-day -day living with um, their peers or something like that. And I feel like peer mentors is a part of the SOARS paradigm. And that's also very important to get through a program and even more so important probably this summer as people are transitioning to virtual programs. Um, the students feeling like they have support or also knowing that others are going through the same things that they are going through. Yeah, I guess I would just follow up on that. I don't have a are you student plan for the summer, but I, I do have a, a visiting grad student who showed up in Boulder about a week before everything kind of went remote. And so now we're communicating the same way that we were when she was back in Minnesota. Um, but I, you know, to try to give her more of that sort of peer group experience, in addition to the meetings that I set up with her, which is sort of, you know, pretty similar to what they would have been whether or not she was in Colorado. Um, you know, I've, I've had my group members set up individual meetings with her and then we have sort of one group, just kind of social chat uh, scheduled. Um, again, to just try to make that sense of community. Um, so it's, it's, you know, taking that part of it online in addition to taking, I think, the core mentoring sort of intellectual research exchange online. And Marty, I, I think I heard you say, I don't know if it was before um, we started the, the call officially, that um, like a Slack channel, was that what you mentioned? Or someone yeah. else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we've already uh, created a, a Slack channel for the, the RU participants and uh, I'm already encouraging them to, to start chatting with each other. And, you know, uh, right now we're sharing experiences of, you know, how the, the the virus is affecting our different communities and so on. So uh, yeah, the cohort building is going to be the, the hardest uh, task uh, in, a, in a remote situation. So uh, <clears throat> that's, that's one way to do it. And I would, I would just add as well. Um, so the, the ASP postdoc cohort, excuse me, cohort at NCAR 
um, they've also developed a Slack channel and some of the different labs and research groups have as well. So definitely maintaining that community in some format um, is important. Um, certainly, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, Daphne has a follow on question um, about maybe the specific medium by which you maintain that virtual collaboration. So specifically, um, down at the OU, REU, they're looking at GroupMe. Any thoughts about pros of cons of Slack versus GroupMe versus some other platform that you might be familiar with? I'm not familiar with GroupMe, but I, Slack seems to be kind of the default across a lot of communities. Um, so yeah. I'm <laughs> Yeah, I know uh, students in my RU uh, several years ago were using GroupMe. Uh, that's, uh, I think it's one of the advantages on Slack is, right, you can create uh, several sub channels for different subsets of the, the whole group. So that's, that's probably one reason I, I've gone to using Slack. Um, it, it looks like just to make sure if, if folks are not looking at the chat, um, GroupMe is perhaps a bit more linear where Slack allows for different threads and sub-threads. Um, another participant, um, Justin Gallimore, makes a comment that the platform Discord, which is commonly used for gamers and gaming to communicate, um, is also another potential interface and that has the benefit of having a pretty easy to use mobile application as well. Um, I may or may not have used it myself a time or two. Um, and now we have a, um, we have another question, uh, maybe transitioning off of kind of which medium we use to, uh, from Olivia Clifton and NCAR ASP postdoc. Um, what are some of the things that you learned as a mentor early on in your careers? Um, I guess being, I guess, fairly fresh into the mentoring, actively mentoring scene, um, a couple of things I learned is that you have to give a little, get a little, or a lot. Um, so you have to be willing to be open and vulnerable with your students sometimes. Um, and the second thing leads on to that, which is also having boundaries. I've made myself available 24 seven for my students, especially when I work um, remotely. Um, but sometimes that can get very taxing. And so when you're dealing with your own stuff, especially with me being an early career, trying to get my life together, um, while trying to help them get their lives together, it can be really emotionally like draining. So you have to learn to have, like try to set some boundaries um, and also taking care of yourself. Um, Cause if you are struggling um, to, the, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to make sure that you're also taking care of yourself by setting those boundaries. Yeah, Olivia, um, you know, your, your question is interesting because you say, what, what did we learn early on? And I, I can think of some things that I learned. I, I wish I learned it early on. Um, unfortunately, you know, they may have been things that I learned later on. Uh, but one of the things that I learned was particularly useful and this kind of speaks to what Deborah was saying in terms of setting boundaries or just setting expectations. Uh, a couple years ago, um, and maybe just uh, two years ago, the, the PhD students in our program started, uh, you know, the grad program had all the PhD students come to their advisor at the beginning of every year with this, this checklist of about 30 questions uh, that we now go over with every new student that just sort of goes through a bunch of expectations. And some of these questions are kind of things that I would have covered anyways, like, okay, when, when are we going to meet? Like, what's our next meeting? And then some things are, are questions that I hadn't thought of to directly communicate up front um, as far as expectations for, you know, what's your availability? When you have an emergency, should I, should I text you? Should I call you? Should I email you? Should I run to your office? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, when I can't get a hold of you, how long should I wait until I try again? You know, if you don't respond to an email within 24 hours or over the weekend, you know, sort of letting them know, uh, you know, what your availability is, what those expectations are. Um, 
And that would be sort of one, one part of this checklist. And I was trying to get a copy of it. I unfortunately didn't plan ahead well enough to, to get that to, to show, but um, it, it, it had a lot of, in addition to availability, a, a lot of sort of, I think, good questions to, again, help you set expectations with this other person and really just the act of, of kind of writing them down. It's not so much like you just say, here are my expectations. You, it's a form that we both go through and we both sign it at the end and say, yeah, we've discussed all these points. And, and it really helped, I think, sort of the mentoring relationship that I have more recently kind of get off to, to smoother sailing. Thank you, Ed. Davin, it looks like uh, from Deanna Hens at the University of Illinois, um, if, if that checklist is something that could be shared, um, uh, certainly let us know. We can include it in the, the packet afterwards. Okay. Um, and then it looks like we have a question from Sarita Brown. Um, with this transition to an all-day remote mentoring schedule, how many students would you suggest that a mentor take on? Um, well, I think it depends what type of mentoring. It sounds like from the question, it sounds like a internship or research type mentoring. And there I would say, oh, maybe one or two, not more. Or if you have a research group, maybe you can take on a, a team. But that I could imagine same as you would take people on in a one-on-one -on -one situation in a lab, in a physical lab space. Um, if it's career mentoring or other type of mentoring, it might be possible to do more or to do group meetings as well. So I think it depends very much on, um, on what type of mentoring we're, we're talking about. And then we have another question um, from LJ West too. Um, from the perspective of a mentee, what were the most helpful things that a mentor did for you? So, well, I guess looking, thinking about the mentor model, it sort of depends. So, um, but I think First of all, just being human, I find it a lot easier to connect with my mentor when I feel like I can go to them and be vulnerable, whether it's about um, my mental health issues or like career issues or um, understanding a work problem or something like that, just being human first, um, but also being honest and, for, and helping me um, like write down ways to navigate whatever situation that I'm in. So really listening to what I'm saying, but also like having an objectivity to where they're not necessarily emotional with me. They just kind of, they're, they're very calming to me and help me literally like write down, okay, what are your next steps? Um, but also getting me the help that I need. I know I had some issues, um, mental health issues started in sores and being able to go to my mentors um, and see say like, hey, I have this issue and then being able to recognize like, okay, we may need to escalate this to a certain level of help and we're going to walk you through it. Um, so I think um, helping me solve problems and teaching me how to help myself were some of the, um, I guess, best things that people have given me. Yeah, I would think the best thing mentors, and again, could be anyone, a peer mentor, someone I work with have done for me is the honesty part. Um, I, I very much appreciate, of course, when people listen and they tell me, oh, you're right, and all of those things. But um, ultimately, the, the really substantial and productive feedback of saying, have you thought about this? Have you considered this? I, I think that's... Um, that's been the most um, helpful. And from a mentor perspective, that's a tricky thing to do because you have to judge when does somebody just wants to be heard and listen to and work it out. And when is someone ready to hear um, feedback? And so I, I find that is often the, the hardest emotional work to figure that out and to give a person or a mentee in that moment what they need 
and learning that. And I've certainly made a lot of mistakes there uh, before. And yeah, kind of judging on both sides, when does somebody want um, to have a problem solved with them and when do they want support uh, to solve the problem on their own? Thank you. And um, Derica, there was a specific follow-up question from Allison Rugg. Um, what does being vulnerable with your mentee look like? Um, I guess the best example, um, a, a lot of students, it's ridiculous what they go through. And it's not like I don't know that, but it's, but yeah, so sometimes, you know, they would come to me um, and, you know, I, I don't never necessarily just force them to talk to me, but when they do, you know, I have a closed door session um, that tell me what's going on. And if it's something that I can directly relate to, um, then I try to reveal that to let them know, hey, it's okay, I, um, I understand what you're going through. And even if I don't, like just helping walk them through their feelings. So not um, guessing how they feel, but talking to them in a way that allows them to expose how they feel and offer suggestions for help and different resources to help them out. Um, but a lot of times it's really me just revealing like, hey, it's absolutely normal to feel this way or go through, it through X, Y, Z. I've been there or I've had a friend that go through it. So really trying to um, humanize their experience based on my own or what I know from others that I've um, been around. So in, in my situation where I'm, I'm usually mentoring kind of upper level uh, undergrads, you know, they often have a lot of uh, concerns about what they want to do with their lives. You know, they, they don't know their, their career path. And uh, so, you know, they, they really appreciate it when I share, you know, sort of the, 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 the twisting path uh, that I took to get where I am that, you know, you don't have to be instantly successful on day one, you know, it, can you can wander the, the 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 forest for a little while and you can still end up in a great spot and i think that really helps them you know uh with their their reduce their anxiety about not knowing exactly what to do next thank you and um a question previously from olivia again how do you gauge a mentee's responses to your mentorship That's such a tough question to answer. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, it's weird, but how much they, like, no matter how much I fuss at them and then I'm immediately feeling like guilty, like, they'll cling to me in a sense. They continue to come back and ask for help, even if it's, I have to give them tough love about things that they don't necessarily want to hear. There are some, I remember one, when I first started, I went off so bad on the um, juniors at the time. I just knew that they would never ever talk to me again. And I felt like I actually, I was like heartbroken, but I, it had to be done. And I just knew I screwed up. And then I went back to work, you know, a few days later and it was like, I went from, them looking at me as this strange person, you know, who really didn't understand or whatever to like someone that they respected. And so I, they always knew like, okay, you know, we understand, like, don't fuss, we get it now. And I started seeing improvement in their behavior or hearing a student say, um, honestly, before you came along, I never even considered graduate school. So those little tidbits, it's like, you think you're failing, but then something happens and you realize like, oh man, like they actually were listening. I wasn't talking to a brick wall, even though they make you feel that way. Um, I'm pretty sure my mentors feel that way about me as well. Um, they tell me to slow down or something. It's like they're talking, you know, to a brick wall with me, but um, I listen. I just think it's just natural to push back sometimes. Um, but ways I found is like in their behavior, like, it may not seem like they get it or they're not listening, but you see little changes um, and it makes you feel better about having to be a little tougher um, sometimes. 
Yeah, I think the delayed effect is, is true. Um, you sometimes don't see it right away. And I think as a mentor, you also shouldn't expect a thank you. Um, that's not why you're in it. Um, I mean, it's nice when people say, oh, this is great advice or something, but really the, the gratification is in if you see that people are happy and as Marty says, they're finding their way and that might take a while. And then sometimes people go back to me years later and say, wow, now I'm in this and this space. It took me a while to get there. But, and they remember things that apparently I said that I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it takes a while and that's okay. And I think it's okay if people in the moment aren't always happy with you either. Um, I don't think you're a mentor because you, um, want more friends. I think you are a mentor because you would like to help people and because you have benefited from it and you want to share. I, I would add to these, uh, add to this discussion that, you know, there's, there's direct ways that you can ask for this feedback as well. I mean, you can ask for your mentee to evaluate you. Uh, you know, I, for my graduate students and postdocs, we do annual evaluations of them. Um, and then I also use that opportunity for it to have them essentially evaluate me. Is there anything I could be doing more of, less that, less of? Um, and I, I've also noticed that, you know, it can be useful to bring in a, a third party in, in that sort of context because they may not be comfortable telling you directly because you're also maybe in a position of, you're not just their mentor, you're also their boss. Um, and so, for various stages of you know university promotion, et cetera, I'll get to see like 10 anonymous letters written by my former students where they evaluate me as a mentor. And, and uh, um, that's been super eye-opening, uh, you know, and it's, it's good stuff and it's critical stuff. And, um, you know, I think you can engage a third party to collect that sort of information if, if you feel like you, you know, have a, a mentee that, that might not be comfortable giving you that feedback directly. Thank also, you. there was a question. I did find the, the checklist I had mentioned earlier. I didn't find it. I, the grad coordinator emailed it to me. Um, I don't know how best to distribute it to this entire list. Probably just send it to Curtis. Um, either that or if you have it in like a Google Drive or something, you could uh, just share the link in the chat. However you want to do that, um, just let me know. Okay. Um, there was a previous question um, that was in a formal program how do you pair mentors and mentees in a way such that you ensure a good fit? Trial and error. Challenge. <laughs> there, there's probably a more informed answer than that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the answer I'm going to give is, uh, you know, certainly in an RU program where I get, you know, 400 applicants. I don't know those applicants, but I do know the mentors. Uh, and so, so it's mostly which student do I think is gonna fit with that mentor. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. You're rolling the dice. Yeah, what we used to do in source, and I'm fairly sure the new source director is, is still doing that is we had phone conversations with the new students so we got at least a little feel for for them and see um what they're interested in and yeah marty's right we know most of our mentors and um then we propose matches but have them check in with each other so the students in the source program have a say who they work with and if they feel after that initial contact, maybe even just by email or phone call, is not gonna work at all, then um, we, we try to rearrange things. And um, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's hit and miss. And I think giving people the, the opportunity to find then alternative mentors is important so no one feels stuck uh, in a situation or having multiple mentors. So at least you have someone else you click with in that particular summer, say, if it's a summer program.
Thank you. And a question, um, it, it might not be showing up in the chat, um, but it is from NRLE Morales, a, another ASP postdoc. And she says, how do you handle situations when a student or one of your mentees want you to tell them what decision they should make? Um, how do you encourage and support them to trust themselves and make their own decisions? Maybe uh, while you get your thoughts, maybe I'll share what my own advisor did um, as a conversation starter. So when I was a graduate student at the University of Nebraska, you know, my advisor, um, he was really just open and cordial and said, you know, he was happy to engage if, I, if he needed to come by my office daily or even, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning and 5 in the evening and, you know, check in and see kind of what I did the night before, what I did the day of, he was happy to do so. Or if we just checked in, you know, once a week or even less, um, he really just empowered me to make sure that, you know, I sought his help as I wanted. And he really just continuously said, you know, it's your choices. You're here for, in the context of grad school, you, know, you came here because you wanted to. You know, hopefully no one told you you have to go to grad school. Um, so, you know, he was kind of like, uh, you know, sink or swim on your own. I'm, I'm here to help you, but the choices that you're going to make, the research you're going to do, whether you go for master's or and or PhD beyond that, it was your call. So he, I think it was just, in his case, his personality was very open to that type of relationship. Um, that's my own experience with being empowered to make my decisions you know, even though, especially at the beginning, yeah, there were times I was like, so what should I do? And he was like, well, what do you think? Um, so I think maybe just when, maybe when you're asked that question, it is a good idea to throw it back and kind of spark that conversation. Yeah, I, I would agree, Curtis. Sometimes um, you have to throw it back at people or just be like, again, echoing back what you think you're hearing. And you can use something like, well, what, what I think I'm hearing you saying is this, is this right? And just giving it back and let people hear uh, what, what we hear from them. Um, and I would say it also depends on the situation. So if it is a really big life decision, I, I don't think as a mentor we have um, any place of giving this specific advice, you should do this or that. I, I agree a person should really... Um, talk to multiple people and try to inform their own decision. If it is something quick that can just really help, um, I think I'm more willing to say, okay, here's what I think. Uh, because there's nothing more frustrating when you're stuck in a situation and you really just need an answer and somebody keeps saying, so what do you think you want to do? <laughs> so I think you also need to judge a little bit the frustration level of the person in that moment and how much they're really in a space to make a decision on their own and how big of a deal is it in that moment. So I think just judging the situation a bit. Uh, yeah. Um, so then a question in the chat, um, did you engage in any training or preparation before becoming a mentor that was particularly helpful? And then as a second part, what do you wish you had known as a new mentor? I had no training whatsoever. I swear I was just thrown into it. Um, I was not prepared, um, but I tried to, because I was also in a position of being mentored by other people, I tried to take all of their best practices with me and apply it to my students. Um, one thing that I find very helpful is to really get to know each student for who they are and handle them how, like, uniquely. 
Um, so I can't use a one size fit all for every student. Every student has different unique needs, come from different backgrounds. And yes, that can be a lot of work, but it's very important depending on what kind of mentoring that you're doing to really connect with the student and be the best for them. There are times when I can say, hey, I'm not the best person to mentor you, but I know XYZ people, so um, I'm going to defer you to them. Um, and still be here to support you ultimately, but there's only so much that I can do based on your experience and what you need. Um, but I really wish <laughs> I had some level of training, um, but I feel like the most important thing to remember is that you're dealing with another human. So think about how you would want to be treated um, and try to apply that to the student. Yeah, I guess I would second that, that I had very little training other than, you know, sort of you can draw from your own experiences that as having been a mentee, but all of a sudden you get dropped in it, you know, this job where you have your own mentees and, and yeah, I, I never had the opportunity to even participate in listening to, to something like this, uh, which would have been very useful. Um, that being said, I, you know, these sorts of opportunities are, uh, they are out there and, and if I had sought that, I probably could have found it, um, you know, learning, learning by fire or learning on the job, um, you know, may have not have been the greatest approach. So yeah, I would encourage uh, folks to, to seek out these sorts of activities. Obviously I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because everyone here is <laughs> already online, but uh, you know, in addition to this, there's other resources. Uh, somebody I think mentioned in the chat, like there's, there's other, um, uh, you know, you can just Google, uh, you know, mentor, mentee agreements, contracts, and, and find lots of examples of those. Uh, you know, it didn't occur to me to do that as a, as a first year mentor, but, but um, I could have. Um, and then, um, uh, Davin, there was a follow up question to you earlier. When you get feedback from your mentees, is there a point that comes up very often? and would be helpful for all mentors to know? Good question. Um, I mean, I, you know, one of the you know, sort of themes of, of this dialogue that you're hearing here is that, you know, every sort of mentor mentee relationship depends on, you know, the people involved and those often tend to be very unique. So some people are getting a lot of, uh, you know, career mentorship, some people are getting technical mentorship, some people are getting more, you know, personal emotional mentorship. And so that, you know, that changes uh, and so the feedback is, is pretty diverse, but I would say one thing that I, that I have noticed over time is um, on, the, uh, on the more sort of critical side is that students themselves wanted more feedback from me. Um, you know, I think as a, as a you know, grad school advisor that, again, you know, we um, for postdocs and professional staff, they, they go out and undergo like an, an evaluation process once a year. But for the, the graduate students, there's nothing formal like that. They just have, they have their preliminary exam, they have their candidacy exam, and they have their defense. So it's possible that in a span of five years, they only get feedback on how they're doing at three points. You know, I mean, yeah, maybe they're getting some, some inclinations from you in, in weekly meetings or group meetings. Are you satisfied with them? their performance or you know do you think they could be doing more of this or more of that but but you may not be taking the time to explicitly set aside time for it. here's my feedback on, on on how i think you're doing and so students appreciate more of that so i try to you know i think uh on a kind of quarterly to semester basis say here's you know let's have one of our meetings devoted towards evaluating this relationship. How well do I think you're doing? How well do you think I'm doing? And, you know, for some students, that's a very easy conversation that we can just have in person and, and others might prefer to have that via email or, or you write something down or again, go through a third party, but, but, but opening that channel to evaluate the relationship um, on, on a kind of regular basis, you know, a couple of times a year uh, is something that the students asked for and, and then I've tried to incorporate more of. Thank you. And then we have a question from Matthew Paulus. 
um, as a mentor, especially during a short program like a summertime REU, how do you identify if, when, and how much your mentee either wants or needs to be mentored, especially when they have lots of other demands on their time, doing their research, writing workshops, things like that? I would, um, as a general notion, I would think it's probably more than you think. Um, and I think somebody said that earlier, sometimes silence is not a good thing. Um, so just because somebody hasn't reached out to you and you know they're really busy with a lot of other projects, we might hold back and say, oh, I'll leave them alone. I check it next week. Um, but I... I would err on the side of checking in too many times and then asking the mentee um, for feedback, as Devin says, is this too much? Do you want to check in less time? But I would say, especially at the beginning of a short program, err on the side of checking in quite a bit um, because time can just fly by. And then it's really hard to catch up if um, you missed a week or two of um, of valuable interaction. So I would say check in frequently and rather err on the side of overdoing it and then asking the mentee if it's too much or if you at some point can uh, ease it up a bit. Yeah, I, I would second that. I, I think, you know, I've had times where students, students have emailed me and they've said, well, you know, for whatever reason, I was I was busy with exams or the computer systems were down. I have no new results to show you. Can we can we cancel this week's meeting? And I'll say, you know, it's fine for us to sort of cancel it in terms of you know our expectations of, of what you're going to show. But let's let's just check in. And especially now that all the checking in is done remotely, you're not even asking them to go out of their way, come to your office, come to campus. Just like let's open the Zoom chat for a couple minutes and just touch base. And and. And maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's five minutes. You say, hi, how you doing? And sometimes it opens up some other conversations. And so, yeah, it, trying to err on the side of, of touching, touching base uh, is more frequently than, than less. Um, even if the student isn't necessarily asking for that, um, I, I think is a good, good approach. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with all of that. The, uh, I can't remember a single time that a student, uh, you know, at the end of program uh, evaluation said that, uh, you know, they, they talk to their mentor too much, right? It's, it's totally the other, that uh, you should always err on the side of, of communicating with your students. Um, as we, I don't see any new questions in the chat, hopefully that's accurate, um, but I did want to ask one of my questions um, that kind of in terms of the challenges that you can find in a mentoring relationship, if you find yourself in a bad situation, whether you are the mentor or the mentee, what are the steps and strategies to improve it? And at what point do you decide that perhaps this mentoring relationship, you need to move on from it? Um. Yeah, I think there's, uh, that's a really good, good question. I think um, I, having been in this position as a, as a mentor with, with students where this relationship sort of starts to break down, um, you know, many of us are part of larger organizations where there's, um, you know, ombuds folks or outside counsel, uh, professional counseling services that can be referred to or even uh, brought in to, to help with the situation. And I had with a student get to the point where I had to have somebody from counseling services, a third person in the room, in all of our meetings for a period of time. Um, I had to block emails for a period of time. I said, we're not communicating this way. This way is, uh, you know, it turned out to be harmful. And so we switched to a different form of communicating, brought in third party and, um, and got through it actually. And, and, and now I have a great working relationship and um, you know it, it but it wasn't something I could do on my own I was I was way out of my league in terms of figuring out how to how to address this student's needs and figure out what they needed and so yeah I sought professional help from from the other resources at my institution uh, 
and I guess that part of that question is that didn't happen instantaneously. There was an escalation of, of events to get to that point. When you get to that point, I think uh, sort of a judgment call, but you kind of know when you're out of your, out of your depth. Any other thoughts um, to kind of dealing with the challenging mentoring situations? Um, I haven't necessarily had a bad experience um, in terms of, I guess, disrespect from a student or anything like that. Um, I've had to check students on their behavior and it is very uncomfortable, um, but as I mentioned before, it's something that you have to do um, and making sure that you tell the proper people, um, like tell my department chair, hey, this is what's going on with this student. Um, just keep an eye out. I just want to make you aware. Um, but I do have challenges with students disappearing. Um, and I guess a challenge for me is being able to just let it go. And I tell my students now, once I meet them as freshmen or whenever, like, I'm here for you. Um, I will fight for you and I will fight you. Um, not physically, but like, <laughs> make sure that you're in line. But once you disappear on me, I'll try for an extended time, you know, checking in. But once you're gone, I have to move on and focus on the students that are, you know, around and need my help. Um, and it's very, very hard to do that, but what else can you really do? Um, so I guess that's one challenging thing that I had to learn to deal with. Um, you can only chase someone, you can't force your help on people, um, no matter how much you want to. So you just have to be willing to let go sometimes. Well, certainly, thank you, um, Davin and Derricka both for sharing those experiences. Um, a question, have any of you mentored an REU student virtually or remotely on a research project in the past? And if so, how did that uh, work out? So uh, I haven't done, uh, you know, like a, a full program uh, remotely uh, like we may be considering for this summer, but uh, uh, you know, uh, there have been times where, uh, you know, a student uh, gets sick uh, halfway through the program or something and, and uh, you know, then works remotely. Uh, and, you know, in that case, you've already built up a relationship with the, the, the student, you know, for, for a month. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, so you can build on that in the, you know, Zoom meetings. Um, so it's a, it's a brave new world where that's, that's your first and only meeting is uh, remotely. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. Yeah, I, I would say we had the same situation as Marty so far only where we had people first come together and then maybe go um, off site. And that is certainly way easier. And we'll have to see how it goes um, if we all have to go to online models this year. I'm still, I'm an optimist. I'm so hopeful maybe we can then all get together, maybe at a conference uh, in the fall if life comes back to normal. So maybe it's the reverse process where you build a relationship uh, virtually and work together. And then it's going to be actually a lot of fun getting together in the fall and meeting people in person. So I'm trying to be hopeful that we'll be able to do that at least. I, yeah, I second that, Rebecca. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and then a uh, question, what are the most helpful tools or strategies that you've used in a mentoring relationship? Um, oh, well, you can go. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. I don't mean to. Oh, no. Go ahead, Derek. I was just going to say, like, working with 
high school students who think they know everything and undergraduate students who think they know everything just really checking my attitude before addressing them with certain things um that's a huge thing not reacting emotionally um because there are some times where you really want to but you have to take a 10 second breath and then <laughs> like address the situation and not with the same fire that they're giving you. And yeah, it takes a lot of strength <laughs> to really just like swallow your emotions and address the hurt in the student and like see beyond like what they're giving you in that moment, which can be very difficult, I think is really helped me to check myself before addressing a situation. Um, yeah, and then not waiting until it's too late to say something. Um, and then, yeah, it just gets out of control. Yeah, I find, Derek, I, that, that is so, I love that you said that. And for me, it's often, um, if we're so busy running from one thing to the other, and then we meet somebody who um, considers us a mentor, maybe, or a peer mentor, uh, checking in with ourselves, if we can actually show up in that moment and be helpful. Um, and another thing I meant to say was checking our own biases when we address a situation or when we have an interaction with someone because we are all just humans and we might be interpreting a situation out of a place that we are coming from and it might absolutely not be uh, the truth and just reminding ourselves of that and being able to meet the person where they are and in their own truth it's hard work and so doing it in between two other meetings is never a good idea i've learned that so rather say, I don't have time right now, and I really would love to talk to you more, and let's find a time where I can be there mentally and emotionally and be able to support you. So instead of just trying to squeeze it in, I think that's something that I had to do as a strategy. Thank you. And then um, I have a question. As you... As you advance in your careers, where do you get your mentoring from? Obviously, we've we focus now on early career and students, but what about as you become uh, more expert in your fields and progress through your careers? Where do you get your mentoring from? From Marty. I don't know. I was going to say you, but uh, no, no. I mean, it it definitely is is true that uh, uh, we continue to be mentored by uh, by our peers and uh, you know either in your institution or people you meet at conferences or, or anything so the, the mentoring never stops yeah I would say that a lot of that moves to perhaps less formal settings you know it may be happening more informally a lot of it is happening yeah at the at the bar at a conference you know when when you're able to, to talk with colleagues and and your peers or um, you know, the, your more seasoned colleagues, perhaps. Um, and, you know, that that's a really part, important part of, of, of you know, keeping up those networks. Um, there are, you know, I, I know in my institution, my department, there are some formal peer mentoring arrangements set up now, but I'm, I'm now at the point where I'm on the, even at that within my department, I'm on the mentor side. So if I'm looking for a, a formal relationship you know I, I don't really have one but as kind of uh you know through just sort of my social network and my professional network opportunities for that and um on the chat uh Daphne Ledoux makes a great point as well that you know many of uh the more senior scientists in the field also get mentored by the younger and early career as well, and it's that, it's that two-way street of, of mentoring. Um, a question in the chat is, any suggestions for helping mentees with burnout, especially in 
the faster paced programs. I've had, I've dealt with a high school student um, this past summer who was heading towards burnout and just seeing a lot of myself in her and using my experience and letting them know like, hey, work is always going to be there. You need to find a balance, even though it's something that I'm still working on myself, finding that balance, but learning early on, like seeing it early um, in that stage, it really triggered me to, you know, help them figure out a way to balance uh, work with real life. Um, and even uh, my undergraduate students, which I don't have too much of an issue with my undergrads getting them to have a work-life balance. They just do whatever they want. But um, I, so far, I have dealt with the high school student and just trying to encourage her to really just take a step back and take some of the pressure off of them and to let them know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to breathe a little. Um, and so breathing is a mantra I tell all of my students to do because a lot of times we actually forget to breathe. Um, we're just going, going, and going. So just taking a step back, breathing, um, revisiting your goals and revisiting a plan, um, a realistic plan to achieving those goals um, really helps the students to, you know, sort of slow down a little bit. And if they are burnt out, let them know that it's okay. Um, a lot of people have gone through that, but it's important to take care of yourself first, because if you do burn out, you're not going to achieve anything that you're really going for. You can might not um, actually continue with what you're doing um, if you're working on 20%. Um, and so that sometimes helps. I would add to that that you know there's there's probably some steps that you can kind of take to to preemptively avoid burnout. Um, you know, it depends on what what type of program you're you're talking about. But say, you know, if I have a new postdoc who's going to start, you know, I've had postdocs say, okay, well, I'm I'm finishing my defense on, on Monday and I can start on Wednesday. And I say, no, 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 <laughs> you finish your defense on Monday. I don't want to get a single email from you for like two or three weeks. Do not. Do not talk to me. I don't have any expectation of, of you know, you respond to anything like you go take a break, go hang out with family, go on vacation, whatever. Um, you know, in a short program like an REU, you might say, look, I don't have any expectation that you're going to respond to this email on Saturdays or, you know, you set aside some time for them to preemptively kind of avoid that. Let, let them know what that expectation is. Yeah. And I would say to that also modeling that behavior. So I've tried. Um, even if I'm working on the weekend, not to then bombard students or postdocs with my emails um, and or at the, in the evenings and try uh, that my staff doesn't get emails from me too much in the evenings or on weekends and kind of modeling it and saying it's okay to disconnect and you're not expected to respond to these things all the time. I think it's really important. And, yeah, Derek, I, I, I like your point of just reminding people to breathe. I mean, that's a really good point. We forget. We just keep going and going. And I think just addressing it, bringing it up at the beginning of a program or at the beginning of, of an appointment and saying it is, it is okay to fail. It's okay not to be here all the time. It's okay not to be okay. And just having an open conversation about it even if people are not stressed out yet, you can then refer to it back later and say, remember we said that four weeks ago? I think now you're at that point. So it doesn't come out of nowhere. So bringing up these issues before they go bad um, and how are we gonna deal with it? And maybe David is part of your expectations, right? Setting that at the beginning. If I see you struggling, what do you want me to do? just asking that. Yeah, what uh, Rebecca was saying of the, you know, make sure that that both you and the student have realistic expectations of what's going to happen in the summer. You know, that is the burnout because the student, uh, you know, has 
<clears throat> expects that they'll be able to do, you know, 10 things, uh, when in fact there isn't enough time for anybody to do those 10 things that, you know, really you should be working on four things. Uh, and, and sort of, you know, when you sense uh, some burnout, step back and, and say, well, is that because uh, this is, uh, you know, that you, you've bitten off more than, than a reasonable person could chew? Or, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, I, I definitely love the uh, it's okay to fail. You know, certainly uh, in this sort of first experience doing research, you know, the students may not know at all what they're getting into. And as a mentor, you're, you're trying to, to have them come out with success. Uh, and, uh, you know, success can, can look many different ways. Uh, but uh, you definitely want everybody at the end to have a good experience, whether that means we wrote a paper or we found out that this isn't the kind of research that, that you want to do, right? So both of those are good experiences. I would say from an NT's perspective, um, me facing burnout, knowing how it feels to crash and burn, um, what I've done recently since I'm mentioning my like multiple roles, uh, roles I'm sorry, I'm indoors, um, first it was virtually, and then she set up a meeting with me um, in person, and we literally went over all of my, my expectations, and then we developed realistic expectations, um, and that helped so much. So now I'm taking this big chunk of what I'm doing and breaking it down into a small actual like manageable task but even asking each one of my supervisors what do you expect from me during a certain amount of time it, excuse me and so that helped me realize what I actually wanted to do was like way beyond what they actually expect of me and I think the hardest part like coming out of grad school or being a postdoc is like trying to reprogram your brain to realize that the same level that you were operating in in graduate school is not necessarily the same level that you need to operate in you know post-grad um, and that's something that I made sure to have like, expressed to my supervisor and mentors who had me navigate how to make that transition mentally um, but also in my work um, and so I have to cut myself off at a certain time and say okay I'm not going to do work at this time or I'm not going to answer emails or I'm going to have to force myself to be okay with this even though I'm freaking out like oh my gosh I'm the worst you know employee in the world because I'm not answering emails at 12 o'clock in the morning not that anyone sent it to me but that's how I feel so to hear people like Becca Hacker say it's okay to not be okay I tell myself that um to listen to you know even my advisor in grad school say to get a life outside of grad school and he not only told us that he emulated it in his actions um like running was an essential part of his day and you nothing could keep him from that period I don't care. And he had kids and a wife who was also in the field. So it was like he emulated what he was telling us. Um, and so that really helped me to resist burnout, even though I was sorry headed and did what I wanted to do sometimes. I'm learning now, though, as an early career to make better habits. Um, but a lot of the strategies that you all mentioned are things that my mentors are actively doing for me now, and they are helpful. So thank you. And certainly, thank you all for your thoughts there. Um, it looks like we have one more question in the chat, and then um, if there aren't any questions by 1050, I'll ask each of you to respond to a final question. Um, but for the question remaining in the chat for now, how do you separate mentoring from parenting? It seems like there are a lot of cases where those lines perhaps could become blurred. Honestly? Sometimes those blurred lines are necessary, um, depending on the case. I deal, uh, working with my high school students, I deal with a lot of at-risk type students. And so sometimes mentoring can take on a role of filling in the gap of what they're not getting at home or even at school. 
Um, so I feel like it's a case by case basis. I have a lot of students who are very independent, didn't need that much hands on help. But I had other students who, even though I was maybe six years older than them, they looked to me as a parent and I have stepped in that role. Um, because it's what that particular student needed to be successful and I was committed to helping them in any way that I could without drowning um, myself essentially. Any other responses to uh, uh, the mentoring and parenting question? Um, I, I love the question. I think it's a great question and um, so I, I'm fascinated by Greek um, mythology, and in Greek mythology, the role of mentor, it's actually a person, if you look it up, was in charge of taking care of someone when the parent was away, and on one of these big uh, exploratory travels. So you can look that up. And so I sometimes have to remind myself that a mentor isn't necessarily a parent, and setting those boundaries and saying how much and, and i agree with derica depending on what the student needs but in most cases um at work i would say having those clear boundaries of what we're not doing uh for a student or with a student is is really important and having that clear to ourselves um, if it comes up and again, you can't solve all problems for people, as tempting as it is, because then as a mentor, you burn out, right? And that's where you emotionally might get so involved that it ends up impacting you a lot. And it might not be the best for the student, but I think it's one of the hardest things to make that judgment. I don't think it's easy. And I've certainly, I'm sure I've failed at that where um, I either offered too little or too much, um, depending on what the student needed. So yeah, I, I love the question. I think it's a great question and it's, it's one of the hardest things uh, to, to, to figure out. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, the, uh, so the uh, blurring is, you know, telling your student to, uh, to uh, in, have good mental health, uh, you know, as a as a professional men, mentee, mentor, um, and then that can also be, you know, you should take a break and like take a shower today, you know, sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, it can can be a blurred line. Certainly, thank you all for that. Um, in the interest of making sure that we uh, we don't go over time. I think now is probably a fine time for a final question. And so I'd like you each to respond. And it's really simple. Um, it's just, why do you mentor? Um, you know, what, what are the fundamental reasons for those of us like myself who have interest in mentoring, have benefited from mentoring in the past? Um, what would you say to people to ask that question? Why do you personally serve as a mentor for whichever uh, groups of, of students or scientists that you do. Um, and feel free to take, you know, a couple minutes uh, each for your response if you'd like. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm happy to go first. So uh, <clears throat> there's kind of two main things. Uh, one, you know, I've, I've received great mentoring uh, throughout my career, so I like to give back. And uh, so this is, this is one, one way to do it. And uh, it also, uh, you know, keeps me inspired to, to keep working hard, you know. Um, you know, there, were, there was a, a period in my career where, where I wasn't really mentoring students and I was, I was getting more burned out. Uh, but then, you know, I started, I started mentoring others and, and that really, you know, brought back my inspiration for why I loved uh, doing, doing science. So, so it's kind of a, a two-way street of, you know, you want to you wanna keep, Keep the pipeline of mentor mentee going but also you know as a mentor i benefit from interacting with with people i mentor so those are those are kind of my two big things 
Yeah, um, to build on that, um, when we survey mentors at the end of a summer program or throughout other programs and ask them, why do you mentor and what do you get out of it? Um, most of them do echo uh, Marty's remark of it's energizing, um, it's rewarding personally, but also really great new science ideas um, are developed by bringing in new perspectives and diverse perspectives. And um, some of our mentors tell us that they even make new collaborations and open new partnerships with people, sometimes even within the same lab with people they see every day in the cafeteria. But now because they're mentoring together or their student meets a new connection, they suddenly um, open up their own network. And I think that's incredibly gratifying. And yeah, personally, I would agree with all those things. It is so inspiring to mentor. Um, I, I could not imagine a career without that influx of new ideas and diverse ideas. I think it would be a really boring day if I didn't have that. Well, it's a really good question. I guess I'll, I'll second what's been said before in that, you know, there's sort of a, a selfish component to it almost that like I get a lot out of it. You know, I, I, I get ideas from the students, the people that I'm, I'm mentoring. And then, you know, you personally in your, you know, me personally, in my, my lab, then I'm able to do more because you, you, you've trained folks, you know, that's sort of more about maybe advising and mentoring, but uh, you know, it allows you to try new ideas. You have somebody that, that can help you on projects. And um, so it, it helps me. Um, Giving back, you know, I, I think about my own experience as an undergrad, being mentored by grad students, by faculty, um, you know, was an invaluable way for me to learn about research. There aren't really classes that teach you that. And so I think, you know, for me, that's one reason why I like to have undergraduate students in my lab or, or be a part of these programs. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll mention one thing that, you know, maybe is a little, uh, well, it, it, there's a lot of uh, funding opportunities for doing research that require an educational outreach component to them, either getting funding from NSF or NASA. And for, you know, the reason I know about or got involved with the SOARS program uh, in part was because I needed a outreach component to include in a NASA proposal. And so I heard about SOARS and said, oh, that looks good. And it's this program that, that already exists and I don't have to go sort of invent something to do on my own related to education and outreach, I can just sign up to be a mentor as part of this program and, and it worked great. You know, it, it ticked off all these other things that I said I, I like about mentoring, but it also helps you participate in the broader sort of education outreach component that is a often required part of doing, you know, research or other aspects of our job. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, a, it's kind of a win-win-win in that way. Yeah, to echo what everyone has said, um, to be honest, I didn't expect to be a mentor so soon. One, I'm naturally introverted, so being social, especially with kids I feel like are way cooler than me, like it was very difficult to break into it, but like I said, I was sort of thrown into it. Um, and I realized it's probably the most rewarding things of my career. And one of the reasons why I have like different part time jobs because I refuse to give it up. Um, I feel like me mentoring, especially at Jackson State and with my high school to undergrad bridge program, I'm a source of representation that they normally don't get to see. And so it's very rewarding to help expose the next generation of scientists of color in the meteorology field and to be a representation like, hey, you know, we do exist, you can, you know, pursue this field um, is very important to me. Um, and it is a selfish component, like the students energize me. Um, they teach me all the cool <laughs> new things. Like I said, I'm an introvert, so I wasn't um, the most, I'm very socially awkward in a lot of situations, but I enjoy being a support for them. Um, it really makes my day. I think um, I'm not a very emotional person, but when my junior class graduated in 2018, 
to like share in their joy and to know that out of the five graduates, um, three went into government, one went to grad school and the other is actively pursuing getting into the weather service. Like that's just an amazing feeling. It's like I can share in their successes. I can help them navigate their failures or so-called perceived failures. And it really makes me feel good to do that. Like, I can't lie. I absolutely hate being a program coordinator, but I absolutely, I stay because I love working with the students. Um, I absolutely love taking them to AMS or other conferences and um, seeing how excited they are about all of the opportunities that they never would have gotten if I wasn't there advocating for them. Um, not saying that falls all on me, but I do know that I do have that impact. And so I try to be a good steward of that. Um, and it feels so good to be in that role. Um, so that's why I mentor. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Um, and just on behalf of the uh, committee, I want to uh, take this moment to thank all of our panelists, um, but also participants uh, for joining the call this morning as well. So um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much all. And for those of you um, on the chat, um, I, I posted a message there um, with my email in case you missed anything. Um, it is our intention. Um, there's a lot of helpful links that were posted earlier in the chat. So please take a moment, uh, scroll up and check those out if you haven't had a chance to do so. Um, otherwise, it's our intention to make this recording available. Um, I think Val, uh, Valerie Sloan will assist us with doing that. And I also wanted to just make a plug for some of our future uh, seminars coming up in either April or May. Um, we hope to have another panel type discussion on uh, networking and how you develop collaborations. So um, certainly we, we've touched on some of those there. And I think um, we would definitely welcome all of you to join us for future uh, seminars as they come. But um, in lieu of that, again, thank you to the panelists and participants. Um, wish everyone to both stay well and be well. And uh, thank you for joining this morning um, again. Okay. Uh, feel free to send an email if uh, you missed anything or have any remaining questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. This is great. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you. Thanks for having us.